Good evening. I'm Dennis Kidder, W60Q, and I'm going to be speaking with you this evening about microwave communications at the amateur bands. So let's get started here. Okay. Well, I am currently a member, but I've also been the former president of the San Bernardino Microwave Society, an organization that was founded in 1955 to, to uh, promote activity on ham bands above 1,000 megahertz. So if you look at, look at the history of, of amateur radio, we've always pushed the upper limits of the RF spectrum. This is thank, thanks in part, part 97, Part 97 regulations, and in turn, in particular, the basis and purpose of the existence of amateur radio has to do with the advancement of the radio art and advancing the skills in both communications and the technical phases of the radio art. Well, in the early days, pushing those upper limits was a tough task. It took a lot of technical savvy, and not a lot of hams had that skill to do those things. If you think about it, 10 meters was considered super high frequency or SHF in the 1930s. That's what we now consider microwaves, where the 1930s, 10 meters was the, really the upper bounds. World War II changed that. New technologies that evolved out of World War II, things like radar, for instance, really spawned some new interest when all the surplus became available to amateurs following the war. For instance, the APX-6 transponder, and what this is is what's called identification-friendly or FOE, IFF, uh, used for identifying friendly aircraft on radar. These operated very close to the amateur band that was on 1,215 megacycles. So they were fairly simple to convert over to that frequency, and they could run FM on 1215. Some other things that came out were the reflex klystrons. The reflex klystron, in particular, the 2K25. The 2K25 is essentially an RF oscillator operating in X-band or 10 gigahertz. So it became a very easily attainable frequency using a klystron. You can see it's actually got a little built-in probe down here. This probe, that's actually a quarter wave antenna in X-band sticking out. This is actually a coaxial feed but that's the actual antenna right there for the X-band uh, uh, oscillator. So these early radios using this hardware were kind of complex, especially using the 2K25s. It took a lot of equipment, you know, a modulator, power supplies, and a receiver to, uh, to use these, these uh, devices. So they were fairly complex. <laughs> this is uh, uh, an example of a fairly complex uh, radio. Now, this is not an X-band radio. This was actually running at uh, 3.4 gigahertz or 3.4 kilomegacycles in the terminology of the day. But uh, Tommy Thompson, W6IFE, changed all that. He created something or invented something called the Polaplexer. And the Polaplexer was a very simple device to construct. It used a tin can and used a couple of probes. And this was a essentially the makings of a microwave transceiver that operated in full duplex. And these things were used clear into the 1970s. And I'm going to explain this polyplexer a little bit, uh, a little bit more here because it's, it's important to understand how this works. So polyplexer design, it's based on, and based on the attenuation between orthogonal linear polarizations. Now, I know this is a bunch of gobbledygook, but let me explain that. It's really simple. If you're familiar with, with linear polarizations, horizontal and vertical polarization, if you go from vertical to horizontal polarization, you attenuate the signal between 30 and 35 degrees. So in other words, if you have a vertical antenna and you're trying to communicate with somebody with a horizontal antenna, you're going to lose a lot of signal, that attenuation because of the polarization change. That's what this means. So we can take advantage of that in a, in a radio, we use a tin can as an antenna. It's actually a circular waveguide. And then we mount two antennas, one for transmit and one for receive within that circular waveguide. One of those uh, antennas can be the probe from a klystron. We modulate that klystron with our audio and we can produce wideband FM. All we need to do for that transmit, this is the transmit side, we provide the required DC voltages and that modulation voltage, and we have ourselves a transmitter. It could be at 
many different frequencies uh, that the klystrons were available for. In particular, I was talking about 2K25, 10 gigahertz, or 10 kilomegacycles. That probe is mounted, the klystron gets mounted on the side of the tin can, so the probe penetrates the tin can, and it basically is the uh, antenna in that circular waveguide. And here's a, a schematic representation of what this looks like. Now we're looking in the looking down the uh, the throat of this this uh, holoplexer. And you can see here's that that transmit port right there. That's the probe. This could be the 2K25 mounted right here. The probe sticking down into the can, and that's our transmitter. Now, the way this works is we have our receiver mounted at 90 degrees, that's the orthogonal linear polarization. It's mounted 90 degrees away, vertical versus horizontal. And we get that attenuation between the transmit port and the receive port. And guess what? We add a microwave mixer diode here, and this is now the, the, the klystron, that transmitter is now the local oscillator for the receiver. Just think about a superheterodyne and how you have a local oscillator and a mixer, your RF comes in, you mix it with that local oscillator and you get your IF out, maybe first IF, second IF. And in this case, this is our first IF. And if the difference between my transmitter here, my 2K25 at my end on this antenna, and the one at the other end is 30 megacycles, that produces my IF. This guy's going to be receiving a signal 30 megacycles away from where this guy's transmitting and vice versa at the other end. So that klystron acts as that local oscillator for the receiver. And the uh, difference between those two frequencies, between the far transmitter and my transmitter here, is my IF. Typically, the IF used in those days was 30 megacycles. And this stuff was all homebrew. You couldn't go out and buy this equipment. You couldn't go out and buy a 30 megacycle IF receiver. But if you were smart and clever, you'd separate the frequencies by some frequency that's in the FM broadcast band. And by doing that, I can use a standard FM broadcast receiver as my IF receiver. So that was kind of a clever solution for that. All I had to do at that point was construct a coloplexer, construct a power supply for the, for the klystron, as well as a modulator to supply the modulation voltage. Well, technology marches on. And some years later, we see the introduction of something called a gun diode. If a gun diode is placed in a resonant cavity and excited with a particular voltage, it will oscillate. And they tend to oscillate from 10 gigahertz and up, those, those uh, gun diodes. The gun diode, like the klystron, can be FM modulated by varying the voltage that's applied to it. So microwave associates came, came up with this little thing called a gun plexer. That's what they look like. You can see there's a, a little waveguide flange here. That's the feed on or the signal comes out or the receive goes in. And it's loosely based on how the polyplexer works. It's the idea of uh, the, the, rather than orthogonal you know, polarizations, 90 degrees apart, this does something a little bit differently. It, it causes a phase difference, 90, 100, yeah, be 180 degree phase difference between the transmit and receive probes by using something called a ferrite circulator located within the cavity. So the receive port is all the way at the rear. The transmit port is towards the front where the gun diode is mounted. And by doing this, we have, again, full duplex communications. And my IF frequency is still the difference between the transmit side of the two gun flexors being used. Well, this led to some really interesting things. How about the first commercial amateur gear to operate on 10 gigahertz? You may be familiar with this name, Advanced Receiver Research, ARR, ARR, Advanced Receiver Research. They introduced a, a product called the TR10GA and another called the TR24GA. And as you might imagine, the TR10 operated on 10 gigahertz. The TR24 operated on 24 gigahertz. These used gun plexers as their, their core uh, component. So they ran FM. They were introduced in 1988. And they ran wideband FM on 10 and 24 gigahertz. Now, there were different models available that ran between 10 milliwatts and 100 milliwatts. And they ranged up to, uh, I think the, the 100 milliwatt model was something like about $700. In, in 1988, that was a lot of money, but it was accessible to any ham who wanted to get on 10 gigahertz. 
or even 24 gigahertz. The output was through a waveguide, a waveguide flange. And so you could actually mount a horn to the output and transmit and receive from that horn. That's your antenna. But you could also attach a waveguide. You could put a, uh, a transition to a piece of coax and run that out to a dish or some other type of uh, high gain antenna. So this really changed the face of microwave communications early on. It, suddenly, long distance contacts became a lot more common. 100 mile contacts on 10 gigahertz, these were a lot more common. So technology marches on. Now, I'm gonna share an eye chart <laughs> and I don't expect you to be able to sit and read this, but what I wanna point out on this eye chart is there are these little green bands periodically there's one here, there's some over here, there's one right there, see? There's some here, there's one right here. This right here happens to be 10 gigahertz. And if you look at this, there's these little green splotches all through this spectrum chart, all the way up to 300 gigahertz. We've got allocations, lots of them. So bear that in mind as we go forward. We've got a lot of allocations on these frequencies. So microwaves considered everything above 1000 megahertz, all right? And you know about some of the, uh, the common applications. We know about microwave ovens and popcorn, of course, but some of the other common commercial and military applications, we've got radar. Y'all are familiar with Wi-Fi and cellular, but we've got 5G cellular coming out. Uh, we also have GPS using microwave. All these things operate in the microwave bands. Well, what do the amateurs do up there? Well, it's something that you're probably familiar with especially as emergency communicators, you might be very familiar with, is Arden and broadband over Hamnet. These are typically operating on the 2.4, the 3.4, 5.7, and the 900 megahertz amateur bands. So we have amateur bands in the microwave. So 900, 900 is kind of a, a, a toss up between whether that's really microwave we consider that part of the UHF spectrum rather than the microwave spectrum. But we have amateur bands from 1200 megahertz up through 300 gigahertz and higher. In fact, we are allowed to operate anywhere above 250 gigahertz. It's, it's open territory. If you think back at the time of the radios I was talking about earlier, let's say the using those 2K25 uh, Kleistrons and a Polyplexer, the spectrum there was 10 gigahertz and above. We had full access to everything above 10 gigahertz. So over the years, it's been sliced and diced and we now have uh, little chunks throughout that spectrum. And of course, we still have everything above 250 gigahertz. A lot of hams are actually experimenting up there, believe it or not. Well, here's something that may astound you if you think about it for a minute. There is more spectrum available in our 10 gigahertz ham band than all of VLF, MF, HF, VHF, and UHF combined. <clears throat> 10 gigahertz is 500 megahertz Why? <clears throat> Pardon, 500 megahertz. That's a lot of space to play around with. We do do a lot of different things with it. More on that a little later, but the but important thing is that this is accessible to every licensed amateur with a technician class and above all of the spectrum is available. If you happen to have a novice license, you can actually get on 2.3 centimeters or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That should be 23 centimeters. Sorry, guys, 23 centimeters and above. So 1296, novices actually have phone privileges on 1296. How about that? But the problem is these spectrum segments that we have, the allocations we have are always at risk from commercial interests. For instance, you may know we just lost a big chunk of the 3.4 gigahertz band to 5G. The FCC auctioned that off, made a bucket of money on it, and we lost. But we press on. We, we do recognize that a lot of our, our amateur spectrum is at risk from commercial interests. And a lot of them we share with other services, such as government radar, what they call the radio positioning service. So let me talk about what, what do we do on microwaves? What do, we, what do we play around with up there? What keeps us occupied? Well, 
One of the primary things we do is what we call weak signal, weak signal activity. And this is typically done on single sideband and CW. And more recently on the digital modes, uh, digital has become a, a, a big component of doing microwave because it allows us to make really much farther contacts, much farther distance than uh, we have in the past with sideband and CW. So things like WSGX, WSJTX, FT8, FT8 is being used on 10 gigahertz now. So it's made a big difference. In fact, it, uh, well, I'll talk about that a little later. And I think there was an FT8 contact made on 122 gigahertz as well, but anyway. But a big part of the weak signal work is contesting. And there are a lot of contests that we participate in. If you think about it, the ARRL and the CQ, VHF, UHF contest, microwave is a, is a valid uh, band to be operating on. And that means more multipliers, higher scores. The more microwave bands you can get on, the better. If you're a rover, microwave radios tend to be a lot smaller than, and the antennas tend to be a lot smaller than six meters and two meters and the others that you want to operate on. So microwave roving becomes kind of uh, an interesting thing to be doing. There are also microwave specific contests. For instance, the ARRL has the 10 gigahertz and up contest. And the SBMS sponsors something called the two gigahertz and up contest. And these happen throughout the year. The uh, 10 gigahertz and, and up is in the summertime. It runs uh, two weekends over two months time. And the SBMS two gigahertz and up contest comes up in May. Well, another big activity on microwave, of course, is moon bounce. And I have to say that the very first amateur two-way communications done via the moon was done on 1296 by this gentleman right here. That's uh, Sam Harris, W1FZJ. He did this in 1958. That's a surplus dish antenna that he acquired. But get this, in 1958, he was running a kilowatt on 1296, a kilowatt on 1296 on CW. His received bandwidth was 100 cycles per second. Now, if, you do, if you're familiar with moon bounce or familiar with working satellites, you know about Doppler shift. Now, off the moon at that frequency, 1296, the Doppler shift is pretty substantial. So tuning a 100 cycle bandwidth receiver to receive the other signals from the other guys who are up in Massachusetts, that was quite an accomplishment. So we got a lot to be proud of, of uh, what Sam Harris did back then. It was pretty amazing. He had a lot of help, but he was the guy that, that, uh, that made this happen. So moon bounce is a huge activity on, on microwave frequencies. 1296 is very popular and it doesn't take a lot of equipment to get on, especially using the digital modes. This is a repurposed uh, C-band satellite dish. Remember the old, uh, old uh, C-band sats that uh, in the early days of satellite television, there you go. Repurposed with a new feed and a positioner to follow the moon and you've got yourself a, uh, station for doing moon bounce. It doesn't take a great deal of power. Got a pretty substantial amount of gain in a dish antenna that size. Moon bounce in microwave is being conducted from 1296 all the way up to 76 gigahertz these days. And I'm sure that's going to be pushed even farther. So the other activities for microwave, space activities, of course, I mentioned satellites. So satellites are also uh, using uh, microwave uh, some of the upcoming satellite programs will be uh, using 10 gigahertz. So be aware of that and start planning. If you're a satellite person, start planning for that stuff. Another aspect of uh, microwave is, of course, amateur television and high definition digital color. That's uh, becoming more and more common. San Diego Peak is the home to W6ATN, the amateur television network. And I want to share that uh, our San Bernardino Microwave Society has been streaming our club meetings monthly before the pandemic over ATN. We actually had a crew, camera crew, in our meeting hall broadcasting, broadcasting, transmitting to the ATN and sharing our meetings with a lot of hams around Southern California over ATN. Some years ago, one of our uh, ATN members decided to uh, stream it on the internet. So now it became a worldwide audience. And the internet stream had a two-way uh, chat room on it. So people anywhere in the world could communicate with our meeting and ask questions and, and uh, respond via the internet and amateur television network. So that was, that was pretty cool. 
Well, there's one more aspect that I want to talk about in microwave, and that's experiment. And that's, that's an important aspect of it. That's what pushes the, uh, pushes the uh, state of the art, right? So this is a photo of a project I was working on. This is actually a direct conversion 10 gigahertz transceiver. It's eventually going to be packaged as a handheld radio. So this is a, a future project from W6DQ. But this is the kind of stuff that we do. We, we do experiment. So is this a myth? Microwaves are line of sight? Well, not exactly. In fact, it might uh, shock you to know that the terrestrial distance America, distance record for North America, sorry, is over 1,000 miles. Think about that for a second. 1,000 miles on 10 gigahertz. That's pretty amazing. Well, I can tell you, my personal best on 10 gigahertz is 600 miles. I'm not close to the record, but 600 miles is, again, a very substantial distance to, to communicate over on 10 gigahertz because we, we traditionally think of microwaves being line of sight. Well, 1,000 miles is hardly line of sight on a terrestrial path. I've even communicated over 82 miles on 24 gigahertz. So it's, it's eminently doable. I will tell you that my, my 10 gigahertz radio at the time had a one watt amplifier in it and a two foot dish. So how is this really possible? How can we communicate over these huge distances? Well, we talk about propagation enhancements. Propagation enhancements allow us to cover these great distances. We talk about things like ducting and scattering. Now ducting, tropospheric ducting, caused by, uh, in the case of Southern California here, thermal inversion layers. It's a thermal layer that acts as a reflector. And so the duct looks like a piece of waveguide. And you'd be amazed that the signal from one end to the other, we have huge signals on single sideband, you know, S9 plus, S9 plus 20, S9 plus 30 dB signal levels because of this duct over hundreds of miles. The signal doesn't get attenuated. It's like, it's like a waveguide or like a piece of fiber optic cable. It just transmits the signal through that duct. Scattering, of course, like rain scatter and things like that, also uh, attenuates the signal, but it still allows us to communicate over, over large distances. Well, why is 10 gigahertz used for radar? Well, it's because everything reflects it's the signal. The 10 gigahertz, 10, 10 gigahertz reflects off of everything, buildings, mountains, trees, clouds, uh, <laughs> Catalina Island out in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we use these things to our advantage. We reflect off of buildings, skyscrapers. You use a building as a billboard reflector and you can uh, get around corners that way. We can, we can, if we both, if two stations that want to communicate have view of the same mountaintop from a distance, we can talk to each other by bouncing off the mountain. So it's kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, effect of being up at these high frequencies. We've got something else we use, we call Boeing bounce. <laughs> As you might imagine, this is bouncing your signal off an airplane. So if you have somebody that may be on the other side of a range of mountains or something, and there happens to be a, uh, an airplane flying by over the mountain, you can use that airplane as a passive reflector and illuminate the other side of the mountain and, and talk to somebody hundreds of miles away. And this is something that occurs regularly around Southern California in the LA area because of LA International Airport. All the air traffic coming in and out of LA is wonderful for doing uh, Boeing bounce. But the other thing, and this is why I've got uh, the, the photo there of Wayne, this is the other thing, location, location, location. This is uh, Wayne Overbeck, N6NB, as a rover. And if you notice his antenna stack up there, he's covering six meters all the way up through 10 gigahertz. He's got four microwave bands on his mobile station for the VHF and UHF contest. That's because he can get a lot of multiplier points for those microwave bands, and it doesn't take a lot of gear to get on those frequencies. And uh, there you have it. So this is location. You just pick your location and go there. So from a, an equipment side, you need low noise receivers. You need a modest antenna. And you can see there, Wayne's got some modest antennas that is on his uh, rover rig, his mobile rig, and some power. You know, on 10 gigahertz, a couple of watts is more than adequate. But Let's talk about distance records.
Islands. How about between the mainland United States and Hawaii, 2,500 miles, 2,500 mile path across the Pacific Ocean at 5.7 gigahertz, 5.7 gigahertz to Hawaii. The guys are still working on getting up there at 10 gigahertz. They're not there yet. The equipment is in place. They're waiting for the opening to occur, but I have, I have faith that before too long, we're gonna see a new distance record set on 10 gigahertz of 2,500 miles. So what equipment do we need? What do we need to do this stuff? It doesn't really take a lot. To get on 1296 is really easy these days. You can go buy a radio. There's a lot of commercial gear out there to put you on 1296. For instance, you can get a TS-2000 or an IC-9700 or any one of a number of other radios that do 1296. And that, that's a multi-mode radio. That means you can do single sideband, CW, digital, as well as FM. And so all you need to is add that, a high gain antenna to that, and you're on the air. This makes 1296 very accessible. The other microwave bands, not so much commercial. You, you really become a system integrator. You have to put something together. You can't go out, you know, the uh, ARR, uh, TR10GA and TR24GA, those were available back then. And those were FM radios, wideband FM. We don't use wideband FM so much anymore, primarily single sideband and other uh, weak signal modes. So typically these radios aren't available commercially. So you have to build your own. The, the good news is that a lot of this stuff, the stuff, the components that we use, our major components of the system are available commercially. They can be... Uh, they can be purchased commercially, but they also show up in surplus and they can be hand-me-downs. We can find a lot of this material on eBay. You can find a lot of it at ham fests if we ever have ham fests again. Uh, and clubs, you know, the microwave clubs. We have a lot of this equipment that's, that's running around at the microwave clubs and it's, it's readily available to uh, someone who wants to build a radio. And from my perspective, it's a really great way to get started in homebrewing uh, amateur radio. And this happens to be a photograph of a dual band 10 and 24 gigahertz uh, transverter that I use. This is the part of my microwave radio. And this is all made from commercial components. Uh, and I'll talk about those companies in a moment here as I continue on with the equipment. So a typical 10 gigahertz radio, the, the components, in fact, the picture I just showed you, this is a transverter. And in the case of 10 gigahertz, it converts a 2.3 centimeter signal to a popular IF, which might be 144 megahertz. It might be 432. It could even be 28 megahertz. As such, one of the most popular IF radios we saw in the last uh, 10, 15 years was the FT817. These were a very, very popular IF radio because they're very compact and easily operate on 144 or 432. But any Multi-mode transceiver that operates on 20 more, 28 megahertz or higher is usable as, a, as the IF for your transverter. One important aspect of that, though, is that the PA, you have to disable the PA. You don't want a 25-watt radio transmitting into your transverter. It will cause irreparable damage to that poor transverter. So we usually disable the PAs that we're down in the, in the milliwatt ranges to, uh, to drive the uh, transverter. So we have to have that transverter, and I'll talk a little bit more about transverters. You have to have an antenna and a feed, and typically that's a, uh, a parabolic dish, but other things work. You can use just a, a microwave uh, feed horn, just a small horn like you saw in that uh, ARR device, the, the, the TR10GA uh, that I had illustrated. If you're gonna be operating portable, which you likely will be on microwaves, you need a power source. So you need 12 volt batteries or whatever your system runs on. And you need something to mount it on, like a tripod, okay? That's the other important piece. But this means that microwave contesting is portable. It requires you to be portable, or as in this case, luggable maybe. That photo right there happens to be uh, uh, Miguel uh, W6YLZ, and, and he's operating from Mexico. That's how we do those 500 mile paths, 600 mile paths. We got some guys down in Baja, California, and he happens to be, I believe, at Bahia Tortuga with his 10 gigahertz radio. And he's got a 432 Yagi uh, mounted above that. That's for liaison. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But we had uh, liaison communications for the microwave uh, contest. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about transverters and explain how these things work. Transverter, what is it? Transmitting converter, very simple. Transmitting converter. On the receive side, you down convert from a microwave frequency down to your intermediate frequency, which like I mentioned was like 28, 144, 432. Typically, the, those are your IF frequencies. On a transmit side, we up convert from that IF, that same IF frequency up to our microwave frequency. So the components of a transis, transis, transverter are pretty straightforward. Uh, we have to have a local oscillator, so super heterodyne, right? So we have to have a local oscillator and it has to be fairly stable. Think about that, 10 gigahertz, that had better be a stable oscillator because it's gonna be operating at a lower frequency more than likely. And it's, it's operating frequency of the local oscillator is gonna be whatever your IF is, plus or minus what your operating frequency is. So for instance, if we're operating on 10 gigahertz, 10, 368, and we're using 144 as our IF, we'll subtract those two and get 10, 244 as our IF frequency. Now, in years past, this is a component that we use to generate that, that uh, local oscillator. This is what we refer to as a brick oscillator or a cavity oscillator. And it's fairly stable. It consists of a, uh, a crystal oscillator running around 100 megahertz, roughly. Uh, the, the, that frequency really determines the output frequency. A 100 megahertz crystal oscillator that's oven stabilized. So it's not gonna drift too much. But we're gonna multiply that up through a, uh, using something like an impact diode mounted inside a resonant cavity. And if we want 10 gigahertz, that cavity is gonna be around 10 gigahertz, whatever the frequency is we're operating on, it's tunable. We hit that impact diode with that 100 megahertz frequency from the crystal, and it generates all sorts of harmonics, just tons of harmonics. Well, one of those harmonics happens to be the frequency we want to operate on. So we add a, a cavity filter to the output, and we eliminate all those other harmonics. We just, we're just the, we want the harmonic that we're interested in, and that's what we use as our local oscillator. Now, we might use a lower frequency brick oscillator with a multiplier, but, but typically for 10 gigahertz, we might use 2556 at a, a phase lock loop oscillator. So we used brick oscillators at 2556. We have phase lock loops that operate at 2556. You run that through a multiplier, a four times multiplier, and you're going to get your, your 10, 244 uh, output. So nowadays I mentioned a phase lock loop. We use phase lock loops because they're a lot more stable. In fact, the, uh, the brick oscillator I showed earlier, you can actually add a phase lock loop to that crystal oscillator and stabilize that even more than it already is. The brick oscillators by themselves are adequate for doing things like single sideband. FM, no problem. Single sideband, you really have to have a stable uh, local oscillator. They will drift around a little bit because remember, you're multiplying that 100 megahertz up to 10,000 megahertz. So that multiplication, but if you have one hertz drift at, uh, at 100 megahertz, you're going to have a lot more drift up at 10 gigahertz. Well, phase lock loop typically uses what we call a, a TCXO, temperature compensated crystal oscillator, an oven compensated crystal oscillator, oscillator, OCXO, 10 megahertz reference. And the phase lock loop locks to that reference. And OCXOs are very, very stable. The output of this, this particular board that I show here is one that I'm using on one of my projects. This is a, uh, a device that was developed by Hittite. It's now marketed by, uh, was purchased by analog devices. It is a 10 gigahertz phase locked direct digital synthesis DDS oscillator. So this thing puts out direct frequency out of one of that top SMA connector up there. I guess it's, I'm sorry, it's not. It's the one on the left-hand side directly out at 10 gigahertz. So I can use this directly as a local oscillator. I don't need multipliers. I don't need filters. This thing is extremely clean and has extremely flow phase noise. So it's very quiet. So that's my local oscillator. I use that for, for some of my radios. Now for the next piece I need, just like that super head I mentioned, I need a mixer. Mixers, this is typically a component. This particular one is from mini circuits. These are a, a, a prefabricated building block that we could use in our radio. So we would just use things like this. We've got the, that local oscillator has a little SMA output. We connect it up to our, our uh, mixer here with that little piece of uh, coax with the SMAs on it. 
and we start building our radio. So we, we become that, I mentioned that system integrator. Other things we need, we need relays. We need relays to be able to switch between transmit and receive. And these relays are coaxial relays. Uh, this particular one, this is a typical SMA coaxial relays. Now that's the same type of connector. Those things are about a quarter of an inch in diameter. Uh, this is what we use to transmit, to, to switch between transmit and receive on our microwave radios. We use these relays. So there we go. Now, let me take it to the next step. Go into a little bit more detail on the transverter. This is a block diagram of a transverter. And I'll step you through this and give you an idea how this thing works. It's pretty simple. Here's my antenna input, right? I've got my antenna. This might be a dish or a horn or something. This could be coax. It could be a waveguide, a transition to coax. But here's my TR switch, that little coax switch I just showed you. So in receive, I go through a low noise amplifier. I pass that through a high pass filter. And then I add some gain, more gain to that. So I've got some gain here. I've got some gain here. I go through another relay, band pass filter. Here's my mixer right there, my local oscillator. And I go out to my IF and I have a, in this case, I have it set up with a separate receive and transmit IF. So this is out to my receiver. And this could be, depending on the frequency of the local oscillator, this could be uh, 28 megahertz. It could be 144 megahertz or 432 megahertz. Now to go to transmit, I do just the opposite. Here's my, my transmit IF signal in, let's say 28 megahertz. I get mixed with this local oscillator. I go through the bandpass filter again. Now this bandpass is near my 10368, my output frequency for 10 gigahertz. And I go through the relay again. This time I take the transmit path where I've got a gain stage, a low pass filter, because I'm likely to have harmonic, uh, harmonics out there. I go through a power amplifier and this power amplifier could be anything from hundred milliwatts up to hundred watts. I know of people who are running hundred watts on, on 10 gigahertz. So that's the PA out through that relay. Now, I won't be using an SMA relay with hundred watts, but I'll be using a relay of some sort, probably a waveguide relay back out to my antenna. So that's a transverter basic. So it's a fairly simple device. And each of these little pieces, each of these blocks is like I say, it's a building block. It's a, it's a module that is just interconnected to create this radio transverter, okay? All I need to do with this is add a, an antenna and add an IF radio and I can be on the air with this. So where do I get this stuff? Well, there's commercial sources. Uh, and this is what I was mentioning before. A lot of these components are available commercially. In fact, the radio that I showed you, my, my 1024 radio, is made from uh, Kuhn Electronics. Kuhn is located in Germany and they tend to be the, uh, the deep pockets of microwave uh, component provider. Their stuff is expensive, but it's the best. It's the best you can buy. Uh, and what I illustrate here is a, uh, the top picture is a low noise amplifier for the receive side. There's a uh, transverter. This is one of their uh, newer transverters that they manufacture and an X band or 10 gigahertz power amplifier down there at the bottom. And I think, what is that? That's a four watt PA. So I have a, a 10 watt PA for 10 gigahertz from Kuhn and a two watt PA for 24 gigahertz from Kuhn. And they're transverters, they're older transverters for 10 and 24. So this is gonna run you some money, but if you're really serious about microwave, if you're really serious about getting on 10 gigahertz or 24 gigahertz, these are the, the components to buy. Uh, but a little less uh, dear, uh, a little less spendy. We've got Down East Microwave here in the United States. Now, Down East has a whole series of gear from, from complete transverters that you just hook a, ray, a IF radio up to and a power supply, all the way down to a uh, uh, roll your own from a bare circuit board. So you can buy the bare circuit board and build it yourself, or you can buy a kit and build your own radio or a transverter, or you can buy a completed version of the transverter like it shows on the bottom there. That's a 10 gigahertz, 10, 368 with a 144 megahertz IF. But these, these tend to be more uh, affordable uh, in the hundreds of dollars rather than the thousands of dollars. Well, another source. What else? How about radio clubs? Especially microwave specialty clubs. We're going to talk about that. I'll give you a list of those clubs at the end of the program. Specialty clubs are a great source for parts, and you could even get complete radios. Somebody might be selling an old radio that they have. They've built a new radio. Their old radio is available. They, they can sell it to you, and we've all done that. 
but along with those microwave specialty clubs, other hams that operate in the microwave bands. Okay, these last two, the clubs and other hams, are really the important part, thing to know. These are your best sources for finding uh, surplus microwave parts to build your radio or even to buy a complete radio to get on microwave. So other sources, and we've all used this for surplus off of eBay and other sites. Uh, that's another source of microwave stuff. And as I said, secondhand from another ham. A lot, of, a lot of microwave hams are very willing to give you parts that you need to build a radio. So we talk about networking, right? Networking is really, really important for microwave activity. It is important to know the other hams that are doing this. It's still a bit of a niche activity, right? There, there's not a lot of people on microwave compared to say 20 meters uh, or two meters even for that matter. There's a lot of folks, there are a lot of folks on microwave however, they are out there. Microwaves aren't for everybody. Not everybody's going to be interested in this stuff. But if you are interested, and I pique your interest by doing this presentation, you, uh, you need to find an amateur club near you that does microwave. And they do exist. There's lots of them. They're spread out all over our country, all over the world. Now, the pandemic has made it even easier to get in touch with microwave radio clubs. Virtualization of ham radio meetings like we're doing here on Zoom has made it very easy to access a radio club that's not in your area. So like, let's say you wanted to see what's going on at the San Bernardino Microwave Society. We, we SBMS, we run our meetings on Zoom and it's a, it's a great way to participate in that club meeting. You can see we usually have a, a technical topic of some type each month. And we talk about member activities each month, what people have been doing, the projects they've been working on, things like that. So it's a great place to network, to get to know the other hams that are doing microwave. Because those are the guys that are going to help you out. Those other guys are the ones that provide the guidance and assistance to build, test, and operate a microwave radio. But another great opportunity that will present itself is during the contests. You can ask one of these guys if you can ride along and they're generally very warm and welcoming to have somebody ride along with them in a contest. They may ask you to help them log, for example, and that, that takes, a, takes some of the tasking off of that operator doing the contest to have a ride along do logging for him, but it gets you an idea. You get a taste of what contesting is like on the microwave bands. If you're really lucky and it's just not that uncommon, you could probably obtain a loner radio from that same fellow and ride along and actually operate in the contest yourself. A lot of us have second radios that, that we've, uh, we've replaced with a newer radio. We take that second radio and it becomes a loner rather than selling it. So let me talk about some of the other aspects of, of networking. And this is probably one of the most important ones because what, what occurs is that, what do I need in the way of test equipment to, uh, to build a microwave equipment? I'm, my, microwave radio, you know, do I need all this? $100,000 worth of test equipment. Do I need all these spectrum analyzers and all this other stuff, right? Do I really need all that stuff to be able to build this radio? Well, the, the, the truth is you really don't. And that's because many hams like myself and many others have our own very capable home laboratories for working with microwave. So it, these guys become very accessible through the microwave clubs. This, this happens to be a Kerry Banky, uh, N6I said W on the left there. That's his lab in San Diego. And of course, the one on the right is mine, W6BQ here in Inyo Kern, California, in the middle of everywhere in the Mojave Desert. That's uh, my lab right there. And let me tell you, as microwave hams, we welcome visitors into our, into our, into our ham shack and lab. We welcome them. We welcome them to come and use our labs, to use our test equipment, because we understand that getting into microwave, it does take that equipment to get going. You know, you really have to have that to build these radios, to line them up, to make sure they're working, to test them. So <clears throat> this is a regular occurrence in the microwave radio community. And these, these same hands, the ones with the labs and even the, just the club members are extremely knowledgeable and helpful. <laughs> Elmering, right? Elmering is an important aspect of microwave radio. This is how you learn. This is how you get started. This is how you, you build your radio is through the help and the knowledge of other microwave hams. So the question comes up, 
why are we so willing to help? Why do we want to help everybody get on microwaves? Well, there's, we're, it, it's sort of selfish, but it's a means to getting more hams active on the microwave bands. That means in the contests, that means higher scores because we've got more people to talk to, right? So we want to get as many people as we can on those microwave bands, on single sideband, on CW, on, on the digital modes, on 10 gigahertz and up. Got to get the activity there. And you might think about this, but no, it's not just a way to get rid of the stuff you don't want it. Well, let me talk about contesting because this is a this is a big microwave activity I talk about uh, microwave contesting. So, how do we do microwave contesting? Well, like other contests, radio contests, it's about getting unique call signs. But in this case, it's unique call signs with the distance of the contact, different locations on multiple bands. So, different locations. Let me talk about that. That's our rover stations, like in the VHF and UH, UHF contests. We're based on grid squares. And in this case, we're based on the minor grid square. So that's that, that fifth and sixth digit out there. So Delta Mike, for a VHF contest, I would just use Delta Mike 15 as a location. But for a microwave contest, because we are uh, using much narrower antenna beam widths and can, you can communicate over shorter distances, unfortunately, we use the third level out there, that minor grid square. So that happens to be my grid square where I'm located right now, Delta Mike 15 BS. And the idea is to work other stations in other grid squares. You can work stations in your same grid square, but they have to be 10 kilometers away. That's your minimum distance, 10 kilometers for making a contact. But what's neat about this is that just like in the VHF UHF contest, you have rovers. But unlike uh, the VHF UH contest, where you have to move to the next major grid square, which is quite a distance, we only have to move 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers, which isn't that far. So one of the stations stays put, one moves and roves, and that uh, becomes a new multiplier because it's a unique call in a new grid square. It may be the same call I worked in another grid square, but it is considered a unique call because it's a new grid square. And this means that if you have a capable radio and you get somebody, maybe even two guys driving in opposite directions on a, on a highway, you can make a lot of contacts and the distances keep getting larger and larger. Distance is that key multiplier. So we might look at this this way, that if I make 10 contacts at 50 miles distance, that's the same multiplier as one contact at 500 miles. And 500 miles is not that difficult on 10 gigahertz. Let's get 10 guys together. And now we can have 10 contacts on 500 miles because those 10 guys are all in the same location. And I can talk to all 10 of them, which isn't that hard. Now I've got 10 times the distance score. So, Contesting on, on microwave is a little different and it is a lot of fun. And I'm going to share some scenes. Now, this is Southern California. This is going to vary around the country and around the world, but these are scenes from Southern California. These are what our rovers look like. So that happens to be Dave WA6CGR with his uh, 30 watt uh, TWT on his rover station. That's a portable station. And that was quite a, quite a radio. Um, We've got a couple of other rovers here. Uh, one of these is, uh, is my radio. And I, I have to say, I, I should probably replace this photograph. Um, I was informed by a firefighter who was part of the uh, presentation earlier that uh, that photograph of the radio sitting next to that propane tank is a no-no. We're supposed to be at least 50 feet away from that. So I, uh, I commented that I'm gonna share that with our community and let them know that we can't do that. We shouldn't be doing that at that location. That's a common location that we all use. For uh, in Southern California for microwave uh, radio. So I'm going to move on to some fun stuff. Not that roving in contests isn't fun. In fact, it's a hoot. Let me tell you, if you've ever done that, it's a lot of fun. And if you haven't done it, contact someone, do a ride along, get out in the contest. You may see a bunch of guys pulled off on the side of the road with a bunch of microwave dishes. Those are guys that are in the contest for sure. So <laughs> stop and say hi. So some fun stuff. Let's go on here. Uh, I mentioned uh, Kerry N6IZW, IZW. I want to share his quick and dirty 10 gigahertz transmitter. Now you see the photo there. That's a THF6 uh, handheld transceiver. If you look closer, there's a little SMA connector with something attached to it. It's a little tiny antenna probe. Well, closer examination. This thing is actually an impact diode mounted to an SMA fitting with a quarter wave antenna 
That's a quarter wave vertical on 10 gigahertz. So not very legal because it's, it's rich in harmonics, but at low power, you know, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to go very far. It's not going to leave the building we were in at the time. But at the other side of the building, we could receive this uh, on 10 gigahertz very, very easily. So that's pretty cool. Little 10 gigahertz transmitter. The other thing that Kerry showed off is, and you saw a picture of this earlier. This is what it looks like today. This is uh, his uh, polyplexer for 2304. And you can see again, it's, this is, you're just looking at it from a different angle and it's been modified a little bit since that other photograph was taken. But this is a very simple radio. He's got two of them that we had at this, at this uh, display that were on opposite sides of the room and we could talk to each other on, two, two, on 2304 with two meters uh, FM, knowing that those two radios are at different frequencies. So we're not talking to each other directly on two meters. We're actually talking on 2304. So it's very simple radio. Now, if you're the really the adventurous type and like to experiment, here's the latest and greatest thing going on. We've got a, a, a what was a crowdfunded project that came out of our, Australia. And you may have seen this in QEX uh, in 2019. It's a 122 gigahertz radio, 122 gigahertz. This is a photo of the part that was crowdfunded. This is the actual uh, transverter itself. And it consists of a, uh, uh, that circuit board with the local oscillator, a PLL, a uh, transverter chip, and a feed horn for 122 gigahertz. And you can see from the scale there, that's pretty small. That thing's about, what, four inches across there? The, 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 the circuit board's about two inches square. So it's a very compact little radio. To build a radio, you have to add some more stuff to it. You have to add some more bits and bobs. And what you end up with something that looks like this. And this happens to be the one that was uh, illustrated in QEX. He's integrated that in with the power supply, the controls, uh, audio uh, amplifiers, and things like that to build a complete radio. That's, that board is just the transverter. So this is based on an automotive radar chip running around 122 gigahertz. That's what's the, the core part is that, that, that transverter chip. They sold well over 100 of these units. I can't remember what the exact number was. And they sold for just a little over $100 with the feed horn and the, and the board. And many of us ended up buying at least two of them because if I build one, I got to have somebody to talk to. So I am going to build two so I can give the other radio to somebody else so I can talk to them. But as of this time, there are dozens of these radios on the air. So something to think about. The, uh, that particular crowds, crowdfunded uh, project completed uh, beginning of last year, or actually the end of uh, 2019. They were delivered at the beginning of 2020 right before the pandemic. But uh, the, uh, there's been discussion of a, of a new project, basically an enhancement of this. And place to look for this, if you're interested in looking about more information about this, get on Facebook, do a search on Facebook for 122 gigahertz, and you'll find the group that's doing this project. They're, they're on Facebook every day. So something, something interesting, something different, something adventuresome. <laughs> there you go. Now, some more fun stuff that we do. A few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, a group of us from San Bernardino Microwave Society were allowed access to this particular antenna, which is the 40 meter radio telescope at Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Now I've done a number of talks about this project that we did. If you happen to be on, uh, on QSO today back in August, I talked about it there. You may have seen it in other locations. There's recordings of this out on the internet. Uh, this was an incredible project for us. We had access to this antenna for two and a half years, and we put it on 1296 at 10 gigahertz. And this is a monstrous antenna, 40, 40, feet, or 40 meters in diameter, 130 feet, uh, 10 gigahertz, 72 dB of gain, 72 dB of gain. On 10 gigahertz, our echoes were 50 dB out of the noise. They were huge. On 1296, the gain is a little bit less, like in the order of 50, I think 50 or 52 dB gain on 1296. I was sent a recording by a station in Europe of one of our operators off of the moon. And it is so clear you can tell who's talking. You can identify the operator. This is unheard of on moon bounce on 1296. But this was a, this was a spectacular activity. 
Uh, we had a lot of fun with it. Like I said, we got to do that for about two and a half years. But we're not the only ones that have done that. And we certainly by, were by far not the first. You think about it, other groups have been doing this for years. We had Arecibo, which of course is no longer with us, unfortunately. Uh, but Arecibo was put on the hand bands frequently uh, used for EME activity. And of course, here in California, we had the Jamesburg Comsat station that was put on the air some years ago. And of course, AMSAT in Deutschland, AMSAT, AMSAT Germany, uh, was active uh, with a decommissioned uh, uh, earth station there, as was 8N1EME, the uh, Moonbounce project in Japan. They were on the air as well with a uh, decommissioned uh, ground station or earth station. So this kind of thing does happen every once in a while. Keep your eyes open for it, because these are really exciting opportunities, especially to be involved with uh, the operations there. And we uh, operate, like I say, we operated our station there for two and a half years. We had a lot of visitor, visiting operators. We had a lot of visiting astronomers from the observatory there. They would come by because they say, well, all we do is receive. We, we don't, we listen. We've never transmitted before. So they were excited to see what it was like to transmit with their antenna. So it was, it was pretty cool. That was a lot of fun. Okay. In closing, I'm going to share this. Now, I don't expect you to write all this stuff down, but uh, this will be part of the, uh, uh, the documentation that I will be sending to Dan shortly, uh, the presentation as well as the recordings. Um, this is a listing of, of active radio clubs in microwaves. And I have to thank Dave and Zero KBD for pointing out that I forgot Northern Lights Radio Society. Shame on me. This is an incredible group that's, that's uh, come up in the last uh, 20 years. These guys are extremely active on microwave and, and uh, kudos to them. And thanks Dave again for, uh, for adding that. Uh, but all of these groups are very active in microwave. And I mentioned, these are the guys you want to talk to. These are the guys you want to get in touch with. Go to their websites. Uh, we've got one here from the United Kingdom, the UK microwave group. And I also listed one from the Netherlands, which is a very active group. So I also provided two websites of two individuals who are very active in microwave, uh, Tom Williams, WA1MBA, and Paul Wade, W1GHZ. Paul does the uh, microwave column in QST, by the way. And speaking of QST, don't forget about QST and the ARRL. QST and QEX magazines always have microwave uh, interests in them. QST has the microwave column and there's always activity going on there. At QEX, we from time to time have technical articles on, on microwave, including the 122 gigahertz uh, radio that I showed earlier. So there you have it. Uh, there's our uh, microwave activity on, my, on amateur bands. Thank you very much for uh, participating with us. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. This is uh, W6DQ. I'm going to be signing off now, stopping recording.